Thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here, and certainly a pleasure to, to see all you folks here. And uh, we'll get going in just a second. Uh, David pretty much uh, you know, gave us an idea where we're going to go with this. Uh, we're going to try to keep this as minimize the sales pitch aspect of this as much as we can in the next couple of hours and give you some insights into you know, how the character of different lenses and how you can get better results with them if you already own lenses in a given category, and certainly some of the options that are available to you if you are looking to expand your visual reach in, you know, in any particular direction. This is a part of our live learning series, and we have a wonderful educational presence at Canon uh, on our Digital Learning Center website, as well as live presentations that we do in the context of partners like B&H and so on. And I'd like to thank B&H publicly for their commitment to customer education, uh, not just having Canon in, uh, but all the speakers from different companies and individual photographers. It's a great resource, and I hope you folks you know, continue uh, to take advantage of that here at their event space. So our program today is how to choose the right lens for you, or right lenses, plural, for you. And there's a lot there. Uh, there's no one lens that's going to be perfect for everybody, and there's no way I can sit here and just say, oh, you need blank lens. Uh, there's a lot of you know, personal decisions that kind of go into it. Uh, but what we want to help do is give you some clarity as you start to make those choices and judgments. A, a quick show of hands, even though we're in a darkened room, how many of you have gotten into interchangeable lens cameras in the last, say, five years, six years thereabouts? How many of you have started recently, within the last five, six years? Okay. Any of you get started in SLR photography back in the film days? Yeah. Okay. So a fair number of you there, too. Okay. So the perspectives are going to be a little different, and we'll talk a little bit about that, too. For many of us, the first lens we start with is something along the lines of a standard lens. Nowadays, that's often a standard zoom lens, a compact zoom lens that gives us imagery from wide angle to short telephoto. And these are actually very credible lenses. They do a nice job uh, with subjects that we can approach. You know, whether we're looking for a standard field of view, they give us pretty good wide angle coverage and decent, what we call, portrait length telephoto coverage, moderate telephoto coverage, lets us back off a little bit so we don't have the camera right in the subject's face and still get a nice, you know, relatively tight head and shoulder type of shot. But the reason you're here, no doubt, is to, to look at some of the ways that you can move beyond that or to take advantage of the lenses that you have that maybe you already go beyond that. We're not about here just the, the person with the most lenses in their camera bag wins. That's not the point. But the point is interchangeable lenses really change your vision with your camera, and they really open some doors to what your camera is capable of. And there's a lot of potential different answers here, and what we want to do today is give you a little bit of direction in terms of what may be best for you. Before we get going, uh, I want to just make sure that we're all clear on the numbers, the focal length numbers, and kind of what they mean. And uh, for those of you that, uh, you know, who started your trip in photography back uh, in, the, in the film era, or certainly even today, for those of you who are using a full frame camera, that is a digital camera with an imaging sensor that, that's the size of a piece of 35 millimeter film, like an EOS 6D or a 5D, there's certainly competitive cameras out there with full frame sensors as well. The focal length numbers on the lenses meant a certain thing. A standard lens in the day was a 50 millimeter lens, give or take. And this, what this meant was a lens that was going to give us very natural perspective. Uh, things that looked about 10 feet away when you saw an image, if you asked Aunt Matilda, hey, how far away do you think she was in this picture? She, Aunt Matilda would look and say, oh, about 10 feet. It gave a very natural kind of perspective, a natural look to your pictures. Wide angle lenses traditionally have been lenses with focal lengths 35 millimeters and shorter. Lenses that see a broader field of view, take more into the picture. When we talk super wide angle lenses or ultra wide angle lenses, traditionally with film cameras and even today with, with full frame cameras, we're talking lenses with focal lengths of about roughly 20 millimeters or lower. The lower that focal length number, the wider the lens, of course, is seeing. And conversely, telephoto lenses 
when we spoke of M, we usually meant a lens 85 millimeters or so upwards. The more upwards, the more of a telescopic, if you will, effect the lens was giving you. And finally, when we talked about super telephoto lenses, uh, we were usually talking lenses about three or 400 millimeters and up. The longer the focal length, again, the more of a telephoto effect the lens is giving us. Now, the reason I mention those numbers is that many of us today are shooting with cameras that don't have a full frame sensor. Uh, for those of you who are Canon shooters in the room, if you're shooting with a, any version of a digital Rebel camera, if you're shooting with a mid-range camera, a 50D, a 60D, a 70D, or if you're shooting with any version of the 7D camera, you're dealing with a camera that has a smaller imaging sensor. We call it APS-C size sensor. And that has an effect on the lens categories and what the lenses are going to do. We have this thing that no doubt many of you have heard called a lens conversion factor, which kind of takes that sensor size into account. I'll give you a visual example of what we're talking about. This is a shot taken with a full frame camera. This, we could have gotten the same result with a 35 millimeter film camera back in the day. This is an ultra wide 14 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. Straight shot, no cropping or anything like that. Now, if we took that same lens and put it on a Rebel or a 7D with a smaller imaging sensor, what's going to happen is the camera sees less of what the lens projects back into the camera. It literally, since the sensor is smaller, it's a cropped image. In effect, it looks the same as if we shot that picture with a 22 millimeter lens on that full frame camera. We're seeing less of it. So we get a, a more cropped image. Now, this lens conversion factor is just something you have to kind of keep in the back of your mind if you shoot with a small sensor camera and you're thinking about, oh, what kind of lenses should I, should I get? Uh, in the case of Canon lens, uh, Canon cameras, excuse me, any of our APS-C cameras, the crop factor is 1.6 times. So a lens that you put on is gonna act like it's 1.6 times longer than its marked focal length. So that 14 millimeter lens acts like a 22 millimeter lens would if we were to put that on a full frame camera. 50 millimeter standard lens acts like an 80 millimeter short telephoto lens. A longer telephoto lens gets even longer. So the crop factor or lens conversion factor actually is kind of a cool thing if you shoot telephoto because with absolutely no increase in size, weight, decrease in, in uh, lens aperture or anything else, you get a more powerful, in effect, a more powerful telephoto lens uh, when you take that lens and put it on a camera like one of the 7Ds or a Rebel or a 70D. The flip side, of course, is the same thing happens when you go to a wide angle lens. It all of a sudden isn't so wide anymore. People pay a lot of money for an ultra wide lens like that 14 millimeter f2.8. They don't necessarily want it to be just kind of a semi wide lens now when they put it on their camera. So one of the answers we have is what we call in, in the Canon system the EFS lens series. And this is a sub-series of about a dozen different lenses that are engineered exclusively for the small sensor cameras. For the, large, for the most part, we're talking about standard and wide zoom lenses. There are a couple of note that I just want to say a couple things about quickly. One of them is the 17 to 55 millimeter f2.8 lens. That is a straight 2.8 lens across the board. It is very sharp. That is a real good lens. Somebody who's like a, a serious 7D type shooter and wants a good high-end standard zoom lens, that's one to consider. Another that we'll talk about some more later on is the 60 millimeter macro lens, the EFS 60 millimeter macro, which is terrific. But these lenses are designed exclusively for the small sensor cameras. The EFS lenses cannot be mounted onto the full frame cameras like a 5D or a 6D or one of the 1Ds or whatever. But it will fit any of the cameras you see on the screen. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, as we go onwards. A quick little slice and dice through the naming that we have for our lenses. And again, this applies to Canon brand lenses. If we start looking at third party lenses or lenses from other camera manufacturers for their cameras, the naming conventions may be a little bit different. But just taking for example, the string you see here uh, for one of our uh, professional wide angle zoom lenses. 
The first characters EF refer to the type of lens in the Canon system. An EF lens is an autofocus lens that'll mount onto any Canon camera. It'll cover a full frame camera. You can use it on the small sensor cameras if you want. We just said the EFS lenses, if it says that in the name, uh, it tells you right off the bat, hey, this lens is strictly for the small chip cameras. Uh, I gotta think long and hard if I'm using a small chip camera now, but in the back of my mind I'm thinking, boy, I'd really like to get like a 6D or a 5D Mark III uh, in the next year or so. Gotta understand, those EFS lenses will not work on those cameras. You can't physically mount them. And then, for some of our special purpose lenses, you'll see uh, a designation as well. TSE means a tilt shift lens. We'll talk about those toward the end of the program here. And there's one lens in our system that is really unique, and again, we'll cover it later on, just so you're aware of what it is, the MPE lens, which is a special purpose macro lens for extreme close-ups. So that's the first set of characters you see in a Canon name for a lens. Then we give you the focal length, the marked, measure, or rather the measured focal length in millimeters of the lens. And we do not apply any consideration here to any lens conversion factor or anything. This is literally the measured focal length of the lens. Up to you to apply any lens conversion factor uh, afterwards. We give you the maximum aperture of the lens. If, that's a, if it's a fixed f4 like this particular lens, it'll say f4. Uh, if it's like many of the zooms with a variable aperture, it might say f4 to 5.6 or whatever that variable is. We're talking strictly the widest aperture of the lens. If we do say if it is variable, we're telling you what's the, what's the maximum aperture when you're zoomed to the widest setting, and then what's the maximum aperture when you're zoomed to the tele, most telephoto setting on the lens. Some of the lenses may have a letter L in the name. This is a special sub-series of lenses, we'll talk about it in a little more detail in a bit, uh, our L series professional lenses, which are really excellent lenses. I don't want to get, I'm not going to, you know, overstate uh, their value and all that, but if you see in the Canon line a lens listing with an L in it, you know right up front this is the high price spread. Some of the lenses, whether or not they are L-series lenses, may say IS, and that tells you that the lens has optical image stabilization in the lens. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Image stabilization is a very cool technology that will get you sharper pictures. Uh, in some instances, you may see like a 70 to a 75 to 300 lens with and without image stabilization. Uh, so you've got a choice of whether you want to pay extra to have the image stabilization feature. Uh, in my mind, it's almost always worth it. And then finally, for some of the lenses, you'll see characters telling you the type of focusing motor in the lens, if it's one of our special or high performance motors. USM means it's an ultrasonic motor, which is a pioneering type of uh, focusing motor that we introduced back in the 80s uh, that gives us very high performance, uh, especially when we're talking about focusing with moving subjects using the focusing through the viewfinder. And then for some of the newer lenses, you may see STM instead of USM uh, for a, a motor designation. That tells you it's got Canon's new stepping motor technology. And these are focusing motors that do particularly well uh, when we're working with video and live view. So if, if that is a big part of what you do, uh, the STM lenses are a nice addition. And the last bit is, this is not the case with this 16 to 35 millimeter lens, but in some cases when you're looking at a listing for a Canon lens, you may see a Roman numeral, Roman numeral 2, Roman numeral 3, etc. That tells you a version number. In other words, a Roman numeral 3 is telling us that's a third generation of this lens. Usually when they give us a new version number on a lens, there have been some fairly noteworthy changes. Uh, sometimes they're rather profound, sometimes they're, they've added a couple of features and kind of tuned it up a little bit, uh, but it's telling you it's, a, it's another generation of that lens. So that's what the naming convention is. Let's talk for a minute about wide angle lenses in general as a category. You may already, you, in fact if you own a standard zoom lens you already have wide angle capability. Uh, but wide angle is something that a lot of photographers need to kind of get guided into. Everybody likes telephoto lenses. My mom likes telephoto lenses. She understands what they do. They get you closer and, you know, all, that's all cool. 
Wide angle, a lot of times, is hard for beginning photographers to wrap their minds around. And even experienced photographers have a tendency to kind of pigeonhole it a little bit. We tend to think of wide angle lenses as something that, well, you use them for landscapes and for like when you're in a cramped interior area, the wide angle lens sees a broader area and gets everything into the picture. And all that's true. There are times when a wide angle lens can be the difference between getting the picture in a confined area and not getting the picture in a confined area. But the wide angle lens is a powerful imaging tool. And one of the reasons is that it can give you pictures that look different than what your naked eye is used to seeing. Especially when you start getting into the realm of ultra wide angle lenses, these all of a sudden become very, very potent tools. Uh, I want to give proper credit where it's due. I did, not, I did not come up with this, but I heard in a seminar once an instructor say, an ultra wide angle lens will change your photography. And I don't think I have ever heard truer words uh, in my photographic experience. An ultra wide angle lens can change the look of the way you shoot pictures if you use it properly. A great place to see the application of wide angle is National Geographic. And I don't care if you're talking about this month's issue or an issue that's 25 years old. Uh, the way National Geographic uses wide angle to show their stories about people and places, I'm not talking about the technical articles about you know, photographing insects or something, uh, but when they you know, do see, you know, show people in their environment, it is such a great and inspirational source of imagery. Sometimes extreme wide angle, sometimes modest wide angle, but they, they use it with skill and grace. Now, with wide angle lenses, as I mentioned, the, if you're thinking about making a next, a next step into a lens, the camera that you're using has to come into the equation at least a little bit. If you're using one of the small chip cameras, again, a Rebel, a mid-range camera like a 50D, a 60D, a 70D, one of the 7Ds, to get into ultra wide, you got a couple of choices in our system. The one that has stood out for a long time is the 10 to 22 millimeter lens. It's been in our system for about six or seven years now. It's a proven lens, does a real nice job. Now, one of the problems with ultra wide angle lenses is they are hard to engineer. I'm not an optical engineer, but I know from speaking to those who are uh, that Ultra wide angle lenses require normally a tremendous amount of correction in the lens to give us good sharp images center to corner with minimal bending of straight lines. This lens is quite good in that regard, but as a result, it's not a cheap lens. Now just this year, we introduced a lens for the EF, in the EFS series to go along with that 10 to 22, which is really revolutionary, and that's a 10 to 18 IS lens with the STM focusing motor. This is a lens that'll act like a 16 to 28 millimeter lens would on a full frame camera. The remarkable thing about this is we get ultra wide angle coverage for 299 bucks, which is by current lens standards, remarkably affordable. So if you're thinking, if you own an APS-C camera, and you're thinking, eh, you know, ultra wide would be cool. I'm not necessarily sold on it. Maybe I shoot wildlife or something most of the time, or, but it'd be nice to have. Uh, or if it's just a matter of, you know, the, the, the you know, budget doesn't allow stepping into the 10 to 22. This is one to consider seriously. Now, many of you may own full frame cameras, 5D series camera, something like that. Uh, in terms of the zoom lenses, the ultra wide zooms, and the proliferation of zooms has made photographers' lives so much easier and more flexible. Uh, we'll get into fixed focal length lenses in a bit, but in terms of the ultra wide zooms, the most affordable point of entry is the 17 to 40 f4. I have a sample of that up here for those of you who may want to come up and take a look at it. And then we also have available two higher end L series lenses, 16 to 35s. Uh, the 16 to 35 f2.8 with a wide f2.8 maximum aperture. And then the relatively new 16 to 40 f4, which is probably the sharpest of the bunch. Now, let's talk a little bit about using wide angle lenses. Maybe you already own a couple. Big problem with wide angle lenses in the beginning when people start using them is 
they really aren't using them right. And they get stuff where everything just kind of looks far away. And if all you do is just pick the camera up, zoom it to a wide setting, and just, okay, you know, click, you're going to probably get a lot of stuff that looks that way. The key with wide angle is you got to use the foreground. Your power comes from the foreground. And the reason is, as you get close to things, they become proportionally a lot more larger and vivid in the frame. They gain a lot more visual power. The cool thing, though, about wide angle is you still continue to see the areas around that. You still can continue to see the background and surrounding areas. But things near the camera not only gain a visual dominance because they become larger, but you're giving the viewer a look that our naked eyes don't see. Now, obviously, you know, people have seen wide angle pictures before, so I'm not saying that. But in terms of what we see with our naked eyes, if we get close to something or if we back off, we don't see things this way. Things look different. These are pictures that people look at and they stop and look a little longer. And the reason is a phenomenon called perspective distortion. And all that means is that things close to the camera are going to look larger proportionally than things that are further away. Now, a lot of people hear that word distortion and they freak out. Oh, I don't want any distortion in my pictures. Um, actually, that's the reason that ultra-wide lenses have such, a, such visual potential. Really, all we're talking about is when you go ultra-wide, get close to something, and you will have images that all of a sudden figuratively speaking, light up. Now, wide angle rewards you when you shoot verticals as well. That added coverage, that added space gives you uh, an emphasis uh, that is harder to achieve with a, small, with a uh, longer focal length lens. So don't hesitate to shoot verticals when you shoot wide angle. It isn't just how wide can you go horizontally. One of the beauties of wide angle is that they preserve that background in your pictures, even if we're not talking ultra wide. Uh, there's no question, just looking at this picture, you can tell it's at a major college football stadium. If I were to have backed up and put a telephoto lens and gotten a you know, tight shot of this cheerleader here nearest to the camera, you know, you'd probably look at it and say, oh, nice tight shot of the cheerleader. But in reality, you might not know if I took that at a major college football stadium or at a high school football game. Uh, but you know, in a shot like this, it gives that sense of place. This is the, what I was talking about before when I mentioned about how good National Geographic is when it comes to wide angle imagery. You hear people say sometimes, oh, well, you can't use a wide angle lens for portraits. Nonsense. It can actually be really effective. And the reason is because, again, it can include the environment. You can make the environment actually say something about your subjects. Now, you've got tremendous compositional freedom and visual freedom with wide angle lenses, and certainly with ultra wides because of all that they include. But as with anything, with freedom comes responsibility. You've got to be careful about what the lens includes in the picture. I'll admit that in this case, I apologize for the poor quality of the scan there. Uh, I'll admit in this case, we included those power lines deliberately. But if you're not being careful, it's amazing how the wide angle lens will start including things that you really didn't mean to be in there. Good example, and this sort of applies not just with wide angle, but in any kind of photography. Um, so I don't mean to sound like somebody's mom in terms of, of repeating this, but watch out for writing in your pictures. If you got writing in your pictures, try to make sure you put it there deliberately. I understand that sometimes you just you don't have the opportunity. You just you see a shot, you take it, and you got you take what happens to be there. I, I get that, but understand that in terms of what the viewer sees, we are a literate society. Now some might argue that, but regardless, uh, we we grow up in a literate society. We've been taught from the time we're small children it is good to read things. If a viewer sees a picture with writing it is going to grab their attention and sort of force it there, even if you had no intent of it being there. So just keep that in mind. That's not just a wide angle thing. That's a photography thing. I mentioned, though, with wide angle, it's so easy to start including things that 
The challenge is to simplify your images. And even though we're, we live in an era of excellent performance, wide angle zoom lenses, where we can just turn a ring and change our composition, sometimes the best zoom lens is your feet. Wide angle lenses, if you really want to get the best possible imagery out of them, sometimes they're going to make you move a little bit. Usually closer. Sometimes not, but usually closer. Like I said, a challenge is to come up with images where you got what you need in the image and nothing extraneous is in the image. Easier said than done, I realize. A couple of other characteristics in general about the wide angle lenses. One is that they tend to have a great deal of inherent depth of field, uh, particularly if you start focusing at any kind of normal distance. Uh, they tend to put a lot of things in sharp focus. If you start shooting wide angle, even if it's just with a standard zoom lens, don't feel that if you want to take a shot like this that you've got to stop the lens down to f16 or f22 to pull a sharp shot out of it. You don't. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Shot like this one taken with the uh, 10 to 22 millimeter lens that we just spoke of with the lens at f4. Not stopped down very much at all. Oops, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to do that. You look at that picture, almost everything in that picture is sharp. Now I'll admit that if we stopped the lens down to like f11 or f16, we could have, could have pulled a little more sharpness out of the, the nearest parts of the railings there and the buildings in the far background might have been a tick sharper as well. But my point is, this is not a lens that you've got to stop, you got to consider stopping way, way, way down just to pull a sharp picture with some depth in it, uh, especially in situations where light may be fading and that kind of thing. Um, you know, don't, you know, stop it down a stop or two and believe me, in most cases, you'll have what you need. In fact, if you're shooting wide angle and you want a soft background, you want an out of focus background, it's going to make you work at it a little bit because you're working counter to what the wide angle lens really tries to do. It's going to ask you to get as close as you can to whatever your subject is, focus precisely on it, and combine that with a wide aperture. So you can get some degree of softness in your backgrounds and so on with wide angle, uh, but again, it's not going to happen just you know, shooting something 15 or 20 feet away uh, with the lens at f5, 6, or f8. A couple of other cool things about wide angle. One is, because the focal length is shorter, uh, you can hand hold them at much slower shutter speeds uh, in, av in available light situations. Shot like this, uh, easily hand held at a 15th of a second. If you combine that with those wide angle lenses in our system that have image stabilization, you can get down to ridiculously slow speeds hand holding. And as long as your subjects aren't moving, I'm not talking taking pictures at a basketball game or something, but if you're trying to get the inside of a, you know, a St. Patrick's Cathedral or something like that with your wide angle lens, you know, don't feel like, oh, I can't go below 125th of a second. I might get a, you know, I might not get a sharp picture. You know, give it a try, uh, because a lot of times, even without the image stabilization, you can get good sharp images. That applies both in available light shots and even with flash. Here's a straight flash picture, uh, which we took some time ago, but by using a slow handheld shutter speed, we're able to get some, some, some definition and sense of what's going on in the background. So the bottom line with wide angle lenses, and particularly the ultra wide lenses, is they really have some visual power. They can take almost anything if you, if you work at it and make it look interesting. It's absolutely true that as photographers, we got some photographers that, if you will, in the vernacular have telephoto eyeballs, and we got some that have wide angle eyeballs, and some that have kind of standard eyeballs. Uh, and what I mean, of course, is that you're, you just you tend to gravitate visually towards pictures that have a certain kind of look and style and so on. You know, maybe ultra wide isn't your cup of tea, but you know, if you haven't considered it, consider it. Now again, just to clarify, when we talk about an ultra wide angle lens, when, when we're talking the full frame digital cameras or a traditional film camera, we again are talking a lens that's usually 20 millimeters or lower in focal length. That correlates with our small chip cameras like a 7D or whatever to about 12 to 13 millimeters or lower. We need about 12 millimeters give or take or less on one of those cameras in our lens to get that ultra wide look. Talk a little, about, a little bit about composing with a wide-angle lens. You know, obviously there are times when you just need to document something. 
and all you need is just a straight picture with a centered composition, and that's, you know, that's the bottom line. We, you know, we get that. But the added space that the wide angle lens sees gives you some real cool possibilities to, if you will, break the rules. This is a straight shot, no Photoshop or anything, just an incoming storm. Obviously, we just tilted the camera up slightly. Take advantage of that space. What the, 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 whatever is in the image that takes up the most space, you're telling the viewer, hey, this is what I want you to look at. Obviously, this wasn't a picture of those boats in the bottom. This is a picture of that impending storm coming in. With that, all that space, it can be very effective to work with extremes. Put subjects off center. Nothing says your subjects have to be in the middle. When you get close to things, real easy to emphasize them, things that may kind of escape your naked eye if you're not thinking about it at first. Anyone who's a serious photographer has no doubt run into this. You know, you're, you're walking around, you, maybe you're on vacation somewhere nice, uh, or you're just walking around, you know, your hometown or whatever, looking to shoot some pictures, and for whatever reason, you're just not seeing the ball well, so to speak. It just ain't happening visually. Uh, you know, you, you, you're looking to see some cool imagery, and it just isn't coming together for you. Sometimes a wide-angle lens can fix that. And it can be as simple as just changing your perspective. Instead of pointing the camera straight ahead, put an ultra-wide lens on. Look up. Look down. It's amazing what visual stuff is out there. And again, the, the, wide, the character of a wide-angle lens, and in particular, in particular, he tried to say an ultra-wide-angle lens, can really open some doors there. You know, We know that it's good for getting a lot into the frame, but it can be really good for just taking ordinary situations and making them a little extraordinary. Don't be afraid to use your minimum focus with wide-angle lenses. I'm going to talk about that in a different context, too. But uh, your wide-angle lenses are often focused down to a foot or less. And once again, that can give you some interesting visual perspective. So everything doesn't have to be 10 feet away. But again, to get this close to something, it means you've got to do a little bit of work. Like I said, sometimes the best zoom lens is your feet. Many of you already are in wide-angle territory with the lenses you own. If you own one of the standard zoom lenses, uh, you've got a lens already that has wide-angle capability. Not extreme wide-angle capability, but certainly noteworthy wide-angle capability. We mentioned already uh, the wide-angle zooms being such a popular option, especially when you take that next step into an extreme wide-angle, uh, both for the APS-C cameras and for the full-frame cameras. But we, Canon also has a nifty line of fixed focal length wide angle lenses, lenses that don't zoom. In terms of you know, what some would call the ultra wide lenses, you got choices like these. And then if you want a little bit more natural perspective, wide but not super wide on a full frame camera, any of these arguably can do the trick for you. Now there are three of these I want to highlight in particular so that you're aware of them because they are relatively new. About a couple of years ago, we introduced a series of three fixed focal length wide angle lenses with image stabilization. 24 f2.8, uh, 28 f2.8, and a 35 f2. I have one of those lenses up here if you want to take a look at it. These lenses are sharp, practical, just a tremendous everyday kind of lens, a tremendous alternative to the standard wide angle zooms that so many of us use on a regular basis. I'm not saying you shouldn't use those lenses. Uh, all I'm saying is these augment them so darn nicely. Now, as I said, we live in a world of zoom lenses. So, you know, you may, you're entitled to ask the question, why would I consider a lens that doesn't zoom? Why a fixed focal length lens when I can get a zoom that incorporates that in its zoom range? One reason is because the, the lens apertures, we're going to talk about the effective apertures in a minute too. But the maximum aperture of the fixed focal length lenses is almost always going to be wider. You'll pay buku bucks to get a zoom lens with an f2.8 aperture, especially an ultra wide lens. I didn't show you a lens on that list that had an aperture any slower than 2.8, and some of them were faster. These fixed focal length lenses will also often focus closer. 
optically, while the zoom lenses of today are excellent, uh, the fact is these often will be even a little bit better, in particular in control of linear distortion, that is bending of straight lines to, so you get that inadvertent fisheye effect and stuff. That's one thing fixed focal length wide angle lenses usually tend to be very good at is correcting that. So if you shoot, particularly if you shoot with a full frame camera, one of the 5Ds, 6D, even one of the 1D series cameras, these are lenses to consider for sure. Shot like this is a perfect example of where those lenses are just in their, in their element. This was just a shot taken with the 24-28 with the image stabilization on a 6D. It's sharp, the, the compact size of the lens and the image stabilization make it easy to hand hold at a slower shutter speed. And we're talking an f2.8 lens, so it's a very practical lens for indoors. Let's briefly talk about the impact of a lens's aperture. And this goes beyond just wide angle. This is something that comes into the discussion whether we're talking telephoto lenses or anything else. We're talking here, of course, about the maximum aperture that a lens can open up to. And, you know, that'll vary depending upon the lens, the design of the lens, and so on. The lower the number, of course, the wider that maximum aperture is, the more light it theoretically can let in, and thus the better suited it can be for shooting in low light. And there's no question, these wide aperture lenses with the low maximum F numbers, F2.8, F2, whatever, uh, they are real appealing if you're thinking about doing a lot of available light shooting. And that's especially true, you underline that if you're talking about available light shooting of moving subjects. Because image stabilization, good as it is, cannot deal with subject movement. It can only deal with camera movement. But there's a price you pay as you get into the wide aperture, what we call fast lenses. You see here a 24 millimeter f1.4, a spectacular lens. Great lens for low light and so on. But when you pay the big bucks to get into the wide aperture at lens, uh, you are going to get a lens that's going to be bigger and heavier. Uh, understand that as you get into wider aperture lenses at any focal length, they become harder to make real good. And the engineers have to devote a lot of effort into making them superior performance lenses. Generally speaking, it's a lot easier to engineer a more moderate aperture lens to be optically real good than it is a real wide aperture lens. So you will pay for the privilege of having a lens like that. Your minimum focusing distances are often longer with the fast lenses, with the wide apertures than they might be with the slower lenses. And again, I'm not talking just wide angle here. This applies to telephoto and so on. And of course, in almost every case, if, the, if you've got two lenses of the, roughly the same focal length and one has a wider maximum aperture than the other, you're usually going to end up paying more money for it. What you're seeing here on screen is not an optical illusion. If I compare the size of that 24-1.4 to the size of a 24 f2.8, it's a huge difference. So I'm not telling you, I, I would far be it for me to tell anybody, don't buy or don't consider a wide aperture fast lens. Uh, they can be just what the doctor ordered. I guess what I'm saying is don't be seduced by them and think about, the, oh, I got to get, you know, that, that f2.8 lens because it's, you know, it's the high-end lens. It's great. If you buy it for the right reasons, you'll love it. But if you don't buy it for the right reasons, you're going to be, it's kind of like buying a big SUV to just, you know, go shopping and so on. And, you know, then you start the realization of, you know, poor gas mileage and stuff suddenly starts coming in. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about telephoto lenses. And like I said, everybody loves telephotos. Little kids understand what telephoto lenses do. Uh, and that, you know, that can be a cool thing. They get you closer to distant subjects. The cool thing is, if you have entered the Canon EOS system, you got a lot of neat choices available to you. You've got choices that range in telephoto lenses from short telephotos uh, that are great for portraits or shots in available light to much longer and more powerful telephotos that really let you dial long distance. When you can't get close to a subject, or you may not want to get close to it. <laughs> now, again, tremendous range of options. Uh, just looking down the catalog the other day and counting them up. Telephoto zooms, you got 14 of them in our system, you know, at a broad range of price points. 
fixed focal length lenses, non-zooming telephotos. You got 16 of them. Again, broad range of focal lengths and price point. So a lot of different answers here. And maybe before we you know, get into some of the specifics, we can talk about in general what do telephoto lenses do? Now again, the, the obvious thing is, well, they get you in closer to distant subjects. Okay, that's, you know, we get that. Think about it a little more philosophically. The shooting experience with those is a little different than shooting with wide angle. Wide angle tends to include lots in the frame and challenge you to isolate, to get just certain things in the frame and exclude other things. Telephotos, by definition, make it easy to isolate things. You're looking at parts of things much of the time. You're getting in closer, picking one person out of a crowd, you know, shooting just one part of a scene or something like that. And another thing that they do, which also helps to isolate, is that by their nature, they tend to have more limited depth of field. Things tend to go out of focus in the background a lot more readily with most telephoto lenses, particularly when you're working close, uh, than they would with wide angle lenses. And this is one thing that a lot of people, even with you know, a standard zoom lens or whatever, don't really exploit, is the capabilities. What happens when you focus at your nearest focusing, at or around your nearest focusing distance? With any lens, you can start doing some pretty cool stuff. Uh, and I'm not talking about with a macro lens, we'll get into them later. But you can do some very cool stuff by just getting in as close as the lens will allow you. So explore that with any lenses that you may own now. And certainly if you already own a telephoto zoom lens or something, get to know what it does and what, what your images look like at, when you start focusing very close. Now we talked about how the wide angle lenses give you freedom, but with that came responsibility. It's, it's a little different, but in the end, the, the saying is the same with telephotos. You, they will reward you if, you if your technique is good. Autofocus is a perfect example. You gotta be careful. I'm not saying autofocus is tricky or it's hard to use with a telephoto lens, but the bottom line is you need to focus on your subject. Telephoto lenses will show it to you right away if you're off on the focus just a little bit. And another thing is you just gotta make up your mind that when you go to focus on something, if you have subjects that are at a different depths, you know, I got one subject eight feet away, I got another subject 10 feet away, I got another subject 12 feet away, usually you gotta make up your mind to focus on one of them and let the others start to go a little out of focus. Something in the picture has to be boss. And it's up to you as a photographer to decide, I'm putting focus here. If you're shooting moving subject matter, uh, it's imperative that your, fo your active focusing point be on a detailed part of the subject. And that you, you know, continue to keep it there as that subject you know, moves through the frame. And this one's you know, arguably the most important. You gotta hold the dang camera steady. Uh, this is a case where just to, to, to intentionally get us a, an unsharp picture that we could use in a presentation. We took a 300 millimeter lens, handheld it at a 60th of a second. No good. Uh, it's, you know, those of you sitting in the back of the room, this may not look that bad. Trust me, it is. Um, this is not what you want. Your lenses can certainly do better. One of the tools that'll help you with that with some of the lenses, not all of them, but with some of the Canon lenses, is the image stabilization. I hinted about this earlier. Let's talk about it for a minute. Image stabilization is a tool which is in about you know, 25 or 30 different Canon lenses now. And again, it'll say it right in the name of the lens. It'll say, you know, such and such, F whatever, you know, IS. If it says IS in the model name, that lens has image stabilization. If it doesn't, it does not. Image stabilization is a technology built into these lenses that literally can detect camera shake, camera movement, and apply its own compensation in the lens itself to send a sharp image back to the imaging sensor or if you're still using a film camera, the film plane. An example here with the 18 to 200 millimeter extended range zoom, this is like a 28 to 300 millimeter zoom on a full frame camera. This is with a small sensor camera. Here's a shot taken at the 200 millimeter setting equivalent to a 300 millimeter. At a 30th of a second, we deliberately shut the IS off. Not a pretty sight. Now just taking that same shot, but turning the image stabilization on 
and we're not using a tripod or anything. These are both handheld shots making, you know, ordinary efforts to just hold the camera steady. You get a totally different look. With or without image stabilization, telephoto lenses reward proper handling. You know, if you hold the camera like this gentleman here, there are going to be times you're not going to get a sharp picture. Brace yourself, tuck your elbows in, hold the camera so that the weight of the camera is sitting in your left hand like the gentleman here. Press the camera slightly into your face to get a third point of steadiness. You'll get good sharp pictures even if you don't have image stabilization in your lenses. So that's important. Uh, and it's important not to underestimate, uh, or I should say not, not important to overestimate even what image stabilization can do. I found myself, you know, using a telephoto lens with image stabilization and just saying, ah, you know, I can just, you know, kind of go on automatic pilot here and just, you know, sort of shoot away uh, in a low light situation. And, you know, again, even with IS, you can get some soft frames if you're not careful and using good technique. So remember that. A couple of characteristics of telephoto lenses in general. One is what photographers can loosely call compression, a sense that telephoto lenses visually, as we look from near to far in a picture, telephoto lenses kind of compress things together in a way that our eyes, once again, don't normally see. And once again, this gives us a way of getting a rather dramatic picture of even ordinary type of scenes. Here's a shot with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. With a 300 millimeter lens, you can see how the line of cars is kind of visually compressed. This is something, once again, we've seen it in pictures many times before, probably since we were children. But in terms of what do our naked eyes see, our eyes don't see this way. The shot with a 400 millimeter lens maybe underscores it. What this means, bottom line, is there are a lot of opportunities, whether you're just walking around New York City taking pictures or your hometown or traveling or whatever, there are opportunities with a telephoto lens to take ordinary subjects and turn them into things that just look different than the way we expect to see them and the way we saw them with our naked eye. A case like this is a good example of a statue. And like a hundred yards behind it on a 4th of July in Boston, this enormous flag hanging in Faneuil Hall. And with a long telephoto lens, visually compressing them into something that I guarantee you nobody walking by saw this. Like I said, a flag had to have been like a good hundred yards, 100, 100, 150 feet away, minimum. Things like this, just zeroing in tight. Again, that compression gives us a different look. And telephoto lenses, of course, make it easy. We talked about this before, to isolate your subject matter. Make it easy to exclude extraneous things in the background. You know, really make it easy to simplify your pictures visually. Composition-wise, don't be, you know, it, we say right on screen here, don't be afraid to put your subjects way off center. Don't feel like just because I can zoom in on something that it's got to be locked into the center. It's, it can be very effective to start moving things off center. Sometimes a telephoto lens will frustrate you. You think, gee, I, I want to get close to that subject and I can't. I've got my 70 to 200 zoom. And I still, this is as close as I can get to them, but it kind of looks cool, the, you know, lone, you know, the lone rower on the Charles River in Boston or something. How can I, how can I, what can I do? Well, if you don't have that 800 millimeter lens to zero right in on them, take advantage of what frame you do have. You know, put them way off center and emphasize all that open space around this guy. A lot of cool things you can do compositionally with any of the lenses, wide, telephoto, or anything in between. In terms of applications for telephotos, you know, some are no-brainers. You know, we think of things like sports, wildlife certainly, applications where, you know, we need as photographers to just simply get closer to subjects that we can't physically get right on top of. But there are going to be some where you can get powerful images that you may not have thought of 
and the first time out. Landscapes are one. You don't, as photographers, we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking we got to get everything in the picture. No, you don't. Think about this. I don't care what the subject is. Something made you want to pick the camera up and take a picture of it. And it may not have been everything that's in your eye's field of view. It may have been just, you know, one little part of a scene. Telephotos make it very easy to show the viewer what that one thing was that made you pick the camera up and want to take that picture. Now, in terms of choosing a telephoto lens, once again, it's real easy as camera enthusiasts to be seduced by, you know, the big super telephoto lenses and, you know, all the cool things that they offer and, you know, the appeal of, you know, walking around with, you know, a big lens on the camera and that kind of thing. And it may be that that's exactly what you need for certain kinds of things. If you're a wildlife shooter or a sports shooter, you know, hey, it's perfectly understandable why a 400 millimeter, 500 millimeter, 600 millimeter lens might be on your wish list. But you may not need lenses like that. Some of you in here may just be kind of getting started in your SLR journey. Others of you may be, you know, experienced photographers who, you know, have certainly been down these roads before, but you may still be in a position where rookies come up to you and say, hey, you know, I just got my, you know, EOS Rebel six months ago and I'm really kind of getting into it. You got a recommendation for a lens for me? I want to get a telephoto lens. One specific one that I can recommend for people starting out where they may not have the money or the commitment yet to, to get into one of the, the, the bigger, you know, super telephoto lenses. If you're using a small chip camera, again, one of the Rebels, the mid-range cameras, or a 7D, one of the ones to consider is the EFS 55 to 250. This is a lens. It is compact. It's affordable. It's equivalent to virtually a 100 to 400 millimeter lens on a full frame camera in terms of what coverage you get with it. Uh, for somebody who's just looking for, to, you know, get going and doesn't want to make that commitment in money, size, weight, etc., this is one to consider. The most popular telephoto lenses in our system, in terms of just numbers, are those that fall into the 70 or 75 millimeter or the 300 category. Now, the reason I say here or similar is because if you look in our current catalog, we have five different lenses that fall into either the 70 or 75 millimeter focal length range. And they cover a broad range of price points, depending on the kind of use you want to put them to and so on. Uh, but for starters, the least expensive one, which is about $200, uh, which by today's standards is remarkably affordable, uh, is the 75 to 300 uh, f4 to 5.6. It's a good lens. It'll work. It's an EF lens, so it'll work with any camera, full frame or small chip. With the small chip cameras, you're bordering on, you're not bordering, you're in super telephoto category in terms of power. A more deluxe version of that would be the 70 to 300 with image stabilization. A little bit better optically, you got the stabilizer. Uh, still a, an affordable lens that's not going to break the bank or your back in terms of size, weight, and so on. Now there are other choices there too, highlighted by, as you move a little bit above that, the 100 to 400 uh, lens series. Now we've had a 100 to 400 lens for over a decade in our system which just at the end of 2014 was replaced by a new version too, which I happen to have a sample of here. Um, this is a lens that has long been popular with wildlife photographers, nature photographers, people who needed the combination of handhold ability and real telephoto power, whether they're shooting full frame and certainly if they're shooting with one of the small sensor cameras, which make the lens in effect seem even more powerful. Now, any of these lenses, let's just kind of talk a little bit about what they do. Uh, they're tremendous for a lot of outdoor situations. Candids, distant scenics and landscapes, sports, things like that. Uh, very, very useful lenses. 
eminently easy to handhold and support. They're not, you know, huge in terms of their physical size and weight. Uh, you know, you can argue that the 100 to 400 starts getting a little big, but uh, certainly most of the 70 to 300 category lenses are, are not. So these, again, these by far are our biggest sellers. Does that mean they're the right lens for you? Maybe. Another option that we can, we get questions about this. In today's world, the extended range zooms. I'm talking about standard zooms that have, start at wide angle and then go to fairly long telephoto on the other end. You know, we started in the industry with lenses that went for full frame cameras like 28 to, to 200 or 28 to 300. And we're seeing a variety of these and we have several of these in the Canon system as well. Got lenses like the EFS 15 to 85, which acts like a 24 to 135. The 18 to 135, the 18 to 200, which is a pretty long range zoom. Give you a visual idea of what even the 18 to, excuse me, the 15 to 85 lens will do. Uh, just comparing as you zoom with it. It's got a pretty fair range. So these are lenses that actually have a certain appeal, even to your high-end, experienced photographer who's been around the block with lenses before. They are versatile. And in particular, they're worth considering if you either are in a situation where, for whatever reason, you are limited in terms of how much gear you can or should take with you, or in situations where you want to fly under the radar. And I want to emphasize that because in today's world, things are a little different with uh, you know, the internet and so on than they once were uh, in terms of just what's expected and what people think when they see somebody on the street taking pictures. Uh, I, got, I got thrown out of Red Square in Moscow once recently with a 100 to 400 lens because an undercover cop said no professional pictures. A cool thing about these extended range zooms is that they look much more ordinary. If you're thinking about, you know, taking a lens, I'm not talking about taking pictures in situations where you know you're not supposed to, uh, but if you're talking about things like, you know, I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, a ball game and I'd love to be able to take my camera and just take some pictures from my seat or something, heck of a lot easier to just get past the ticket takers and security with one of these lenses like I just showed you than it would be with one of those. So that's a, re a viable reason, even though people don't think of these extended range zooms as being, quote, professional lenses, end quote. That's a viable reason that even the highest end shooters might want to have one of these on the shelf at home. In terms of the image quality these lenses deliver, the 15 to 85 is actually extremely good. That is a very good extended range zoom if you shoot with one of the small chip cameras. Again, it's an EFS lens, so you can't use it on a full frame. Um, but in general, understand that to an optical designer, as you ask a lens to go to cover an ever-increasing range of zoom settings, it becomes increasingly hard to get it to be optically good all the way through without a lot of compromises. So there's a reason why you see professionals often using lenses with what may appear on paper to be modest focal lengths, a 24 to 70 or something like that, uh, as opposed to a lens that's you know, like a, a 24 to 300. Um, it's not to say that extended range zooms can't take a good picture, but it's harder to make them excellent all the way through their zoom range. Just something to keep in mind. That's a generalization. Anytime you generalize, there are gonna be exceptions. Now. Another thing, whether we're talking the telephoto zooms like those 70 to 300s I mentioned, or one of those extended range zooms, there's one other drawback that you gotta be aware of depending on the type of shooting you like to do. And that is, these lenses have maximum lens openings of about 5.6, give or take. The bottom line is that means they don't let a heck of a lot of light into the camera. Outdoors, no problem. Indoors, might be. They become hard to use. Now, as, as my colleague David Brommer said at the beginning, in today's world, ISO is a great equalizer. 
There was a time when I got started shooting that the idea of shooting indoor pictures, color pictures without flash at anything above an ISO of like 800 was almost unthinkable. Nowadays, we are gifted with cameras that can, even at moderate price points, that can easily shoot at 3,200, 6,400, and give us decent results, in some cases spectacular results. So you can make these lenses with the moderate apertures work if you shoot occasionally in low light. But if they're a big part of what you do, that is shooting in low light, and in particular if you're shooting moving subjects in low light, then it becomes a little more of a problem. Now, you can use the higher ISOs. That, like I say, will work in, in some situations quite well. You, if your subjects aren't that far away, you could consider using flash. Or you could just consider a telephoto lens that has a wider maximum aperture. And there are a lot of serious photographers who work daily with zoom lenses like a 70 to 300 or something in that range and also have a fixed focal length lens that they use for their indoor candids and that kind of thing. We're not necessarily talking about the big white super telephoto lenses here. Let me introduce you to a lens like the 85 f1.8 or at a little bit higher price point the 135 f2. These lenses are crackerjack for available light shooting. They let a lot more light into the camera, very, very versatile. The 85 1.8 has been one of my favorites for available light candidates for a long time. Put it on a full frame camera, it's an 85 millimeter field of view, so to speak. Put it on a small sensor camera like a 7D, you now got an f1.8 lens that covers the field that about 135 millimeter lens would on a full frame camera. This lens is just dandy for things like theater work and stuff like that. And it's a classic example of what I was talking about earlier, about not necessarily being seduced by expensive, heavy, wide aperture lenses. We make an 85 f1.2 lens, which is legendary among folks that do certain types of available light work and portraiture and stuff like that. It's an L-series lens. It costs over $2,000. Um, it's a great lens, and it's had a great reputation for a long time. This 85 f1.8 costs about $420. It's superb. The thing is just a crackerjack lens for this kind of work. The 135 f2, another one that, while it's a little more money, uh, just a great lens for available light shooting without flash. If you were, just to take one example, if you were thinking about shooting weddings or you're already an established wedding photographer, these are lenses that could easily join your bag in addition to any of the zoom lenses that you ordinarily use. Think about this. A lens with an aperture of roughly f2 is letting about eight times more light into the camera than an f5.6 lens. So I'm not saying don't consider those 75 to 300 zooms. They're very versatile, great traveling companions and so on. But you may reach that point where you need to take that next step beyond, and you, don't, you may not want that to be a $2,000 step. Understand you got options. You've heard me use the phrase portrait lenses, and you've probably heard other people use it too. Traditionally, when people talk about portrait lenses, we're talking about lenses of modest telephoto power that really are nice in traditional portrait applications. When we talked about film cameras, and certainly today with full frame cameras, we're referring to lenses usually that are in that range of roughly 85 to about 135 millimeters in focal length. Anything that falls within that, you can think of it, you're in that portrait focal length range. It just gives a very nice perspective. You can back off a little bit from your subjects and not be, you know, breathing right down their neck, so to speak, and so on. Shot like this one was taken at 100 millimeters. We certainly could have stepped closer to the young lady here if we'd wanted to and still gotten a very nice shot without being like literally, you know, quote, in her face, end quote. Now, if you have an APS-C camera, again, a 7D, a Rebel, one of the small sensor cameras, to get that same moderate telephoto portrait length effect, you'd be talking a lens that's somewhere between 50 to about 85 millimeters. Anything, regardless of whether it's a zoom or not a zoom, Anything in that range will give you about that same traditional portrait focal length coverage. One lens you haven't heard me talk about is one of our most popular high-end lenses, and that's the 70-200 to category. Uh, the 70-200 to 2.8, if you shoot in low light, 
want zooming and you want telephoto, and you don't mind putting up with some added size, weight, and cost, this is the professional answer. The 70 to 200 2 8s, uh, for a long time, have become a standard lens among photojournalists and uh, you know tons and tons of other working photographers. Um, we have two versions in our system right now with an f2.8 aperture, uh, a version with IS and then a less expensive version without IS. So we do give you the choice there in terms of price points and whether or not you want the image stabilization. These lenses are just tremendous portrait lenses, giving you the ability to zoom to an even longer focal length if you need to. If you do put them on one of the small chip cameras, you get the effect of the lens becoming, in effect, even more powerful. It's actually now equivalent to, in terms of coverage, to a lens over 300 millimeters. I find that they're great in what I call controlled situations. You, if you're taking candids at an outdoor event, you know, whether it's a wedding or something like that, uh, situations where you want to maybe back off a little bit and just kind of let people be themselves, they work tremendously. And I hasten to add uh, that there's also a, a pair of 70 to 200 F4 L series lenses, significantly lighter in weight, Signif significantly less expensive and very, very sharp. If the size and the weight of a 70 to 200 28 just seems like it's a little bit much, those 70 to 200 F4s are a great alternative if you're not doing like high school basketball and indoors at night. Um, but back to my point about um, these lenses being great in controlled situations, um, especially if you're shooting with a full frame camera. If you prefer a real type of candid approach to street photography and that kind of thing, or if you're shooting things like outdoor sports, you're going to find a 70 to 200 is often not enough. Now, everybody's opinion is going to be a little different on that, depending on the way you shoot and the kind of subjects you like to shoot and so on. Uh, so, you know, take that with a bit of a grain of salt. But there are reasons that photographers may want to go beyond that 200 millimeter plateau. You know, a long telephoto lens can actually be very effective for portraits. Uh, we don't, we, you know, we, we don't think of them as classic portrait lenses, but you know, I've seen beautiful results with lenses, 300 millimeter as shown here and beyond, uh, that you know, blow out the backgrounds in terms of you know, throwing them completely out of focus and just you know, razor sharp images of the subject's face and that kind of thing. Um, so don't assume that because we talk about a portrait length telephoto as being that 85 to about 135, that, oh, well, if I'm shooting portraits, I can only shoot it between 85 and 135. Nonsense. Talk a little, about, a little bit about longer telephoto lenses. And you know, traditionally, when we talk super telephotos, long telephotos, traditionally, we're looking at lenses that are roughly 400 millimeters and beyond. Uh, this is where, as I said before, you kind of start dialing long distance. You start really being able to bring distant things closer to you, and at the same time, getting even more of that telephoto effect, that limited depth of field, that compression of near and distant objects visually, and so on. Lens like the 100 to 400 is just a marvelous lens for street photography, for candids and stuff like that. 400 millimeters is actually kind of a sweet spot in a lot of ways for a lot of photographers, whether you're talking this type of thing. Um, sports. Um, it, if you, I, I guarantee you, if you, at the highest levels, if you were to ask like photographers that you know, are on staff at Sports Illustrated or photographers of about that you know, level in terms of their skill and experience, what's their standard lens? I guarantee you the first one they say is a 400. Um, that isn't to say they don't use others, longer and, and wider. Um, but a 400 millimeter lens for outdoor sports in particular, but even for indoor sports where you can't get close, can really you know, make a difference. Wildlife photographers traditionally have uh, gone to even longer lenses like the 500 millimeter, or if they don't mind the size and the weight, the 600, uh, because of its ability to get distant things really close and impactful. We've been talking about telephoto lenses. We talked about the different types of telephoto lenses, the different ranges. You may be asking yourself, okay, how much telephoto lens do I need? I, you know, for whatever your application is. I'm gonna give you a couple of ways you may be able to help figure this out without going out and buying lenses and trying them and returning them to B&H. <laughs> One way involves taking a picture, I don't mean necessarily photographing something now, but just going into your archives or your files and taking a look at a picture where you know the focal length of the lens that was used to take it. That could be a digital picture that you, you know, look at the, you know, the EXIF data and you say, aha, you know, this is the date, this is the time, ah, 200 millimeters. 
or it could be, you know, even an old print or something from a film camera. But you know, you remember, oh, I took that with my, you know, first 70 to 200 millimeter lens at 200 millimeter, whatever the case may be. Let's say we got a picture here, an existing picture, and we know we took it at 200 millimeters. Don't do this with a magic marker, but in your mind, draw a line horizontally and vertically, cutting the image in half horizontally and in half vertically. Okay? Now, look at one quarter of the area of that picture. That's what you'd cover if you doubled your focal length. So in other words, this is the shot we got with, hypothetically, with a 200 millimeter lens. If we had taken this with a 400, we would have gotten that coverage. So that's one way of asking yourself, you know, you may already own a lens like a 70 to 200. You know, and you may have, you know, say, hey, that funny looking guy from Canon came to B&H for that seminar and was talking about some of those super telephotos and, you know, I, I shoot a lot of sports hypothetically or something. And you're thinking, gee, should I, you know, consider getting a 400 millimeter lens? Would that be enough? Well, th that's one way of answering the question, at least to some degree. There's another way I can show you. This you may want to take out a piece of paper. I'll give you a little time to write some things down. Um, and this answers the question, how far away do I have to be to get a frame filling shot of a person standing upright? Okay, so let's say, let's say I want to take a picture of a six foot tall person. I want to take a horizontal picture. And I want a telephoto lens. I want to be able to step back, whether I'm shooting sports or whatever else it might be. Okay? I want to fill the frame with that person standing upright and leaving a little room, you know, above the head and below the feet, a little breathing room in the frame. But basically, I want a, a frame filling shot of them from head to toe. How much lens power do I need to be a given distance away? No, this will give you an answer. If I've got a full frame camera, again, horizontal shot, and we're, I understand the picture is of a kid playing youth football, work with me on this, okay, when I talk about a six foot tall person. Um, these would be approximately how far away you could be and still get that frame filling shot. In other words, I could be about 120 feet away with a 400 millimeter lens and get a frame filling shot of an adult, a normal sized adult standing upright. Put a 200 millimeter lens, I could get that shot from about 60 feet away with a full frame camera like a 5D or a 6D or something like that. I'll give you a moment to write those down. You good? I mentioned that with the APS-C sensor cameras, the smaller sensor cameras like a 7D, a 7D Mark II, any of those, any lens we put on the camera actually acts more powerful in terms of what we see than its marked focal length. In effect, the lens becomes more powerful, in effect. If I wanted to do the same thing there, six foot tall person standing upright, a little bit of breathing room above and below, and a horizontal shot, how far away do I have to be? No, I can be even a little further away. Again, the lens acts more powerful. With a 200 millimeter lens, I can get that shot from 100 feet away. With a 400 millimeter lens, I can get it from 200 feet away. I understand, of course, these numbers are approximate. I'm not saying that at 199 feet with a 400 millimeter lens, you're gonna, you're totally out to lunch. It's, you know, it's again, these are approximate, but they give you an idea. I'll give you a moment to copy those down for anybody that needs to or is interested. We have the same thing for vertical shots. Again, if I'm working with a full frame camera and I want to get a shot like this, pretty much filling a frame from top to bottom with a full length shot of a, an adult. With a 200 millimeter lens, I can get that shot from about 40 feet away with a full frame camera. 500 millimeter lens, I can get that shot from about 100 feet away. And then finally, if I'm using an APS-C camera, again, a 70D, 7D, something like that, 
my lens acts more powerful. So the numbers change a little bit. I can get that pretty tight vertical shot, head to toe, from about 100 feet away with a 300 millimeter lens. I can be about 160 feet away with a 500 millimeter lens and fill the frame head to toe with a normal sized adult. So that's another reference in terms of how much lens do I need. If you think about the distances you're likely to be working if you're shooting people, that's a reference you can use and sort of apply to uh, you know, future lens choices. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, all right, that's cool if you shoot athletes, but I want to shoot birds. I want to go on safari and shoot elephants. You know, what then? You know, I'm not shooting people uh, from those kind of distances. All right. We actually wrote on our Digital Learning Center website, which is totally free. There's no passwords or anything. Um, this is the URL, www.learn.usa.canon.com. We actually wrote a two-part article that gives you easy calculations that you can do with a pencil and a calculator. I could give you the exact URL for the articles, but it's one of those long arcane ones that would take you half an hour to write the whole URL string down. So it's easier to just go on to the Digital Learning Center lead page, uh, and then in the search area, there's a little search field right up top, just type in lens calculations and click go. And the first two, if you're and with any luck, the first two things that come up are these first two articles. And uh, makes it very easy to understand uh, and to calculate pretty precisely uh, how much lens do you need uh, and answer other questions about lenses as well in terms of how far away do I need to be. Even let you figure out if you're looking at a picture that you took a long time ago, you can count, there are ways to calculate how big was that actual subject if you know about how far away you were. So it's, an, it's interesting reading. Now, to the young lady's question about tele-extenders. Tele-extenders or telephoto extenders uh, or tele-converters as they're sometimes called uh, are, have been around in our industry for a long time. They are an affordable, easy way to get more telephoto power out of an existing telephoto lens uh, for those times when you need it. We make two in our system, and we are in our third generation at this point. Uh, so as I speak, uh, we have a 1.4x, and you'll see that there's a version 3, Roman numeral 3 in the model name, and there's a 2x. Uh, extender, which doubles the focal length, and again, it, it says 2x version 3. The extenders basically attach to the front of your lens, and then the lens and extender combination just simply go onto the camera. Uh, so they're pretty easy to use. For technical reasons, with the 1.4 times extender, you will lose one stop of light being transmitted into the camera. There is a light loss. So I guess this is one of these areas where there's no free lunch. Uh, you will lose a stop with a 1.4 extender. Your lens, in effect, becomes one stop slower. And with a 2x extender, for technical reasons, you lose two stops of light. And again, this is one of these laws of physics types of things, so it's not just you know some mean engineers at Canon deciding to make it difficult for Canon users. But they still remain a very effective way of taking a given lens and increasing its relative power. You can take a 135 millimeter lens, and obviously multiply its power by 1.4 times or two times, and you can do the same thing with longer lenses as well. One of the very cool things about tele-extenders is they don't change the lens's minimum focusing distance. I'm going to give you some examples of tele-extenders with different telephoto lenses getting longer and longer as we go on. Um, but that's one aspect of their power is they don't change. What, whatever your lens could focus to before, it remains that distance in terms of how near you can focus with an extender in place. This is, and it, comes to, it really comes to fruition in a shot like this one. This is the 300 millimeter f4 lens. has been in our lineup for a long time, and to a lot of photographers, it kind of flies under the radar. Yeah, it's an L-series lens, but it's not the big 2.8 lens. You know, it hasn't been, you know, redone in a while, so it's, you know, it's been in the lineup for, for some time now. But that lens is so practical, so easy to handhold, very sharp, and the minimum focusing distance on that lens is less than five feet. 
which is remarkable for a 300 millimeter lens. Now, you take that and you put a 2x extender on, you got a 600 millimeter lens that'll focus to under five feet. As good as our 600 millimeter f4 is, it will not focus by itself to under five feet. Uh, so this is a combination that you can hand hold, take advantage of the image stabilization, and still get great results. So the short answer is, tele extenders can be a real cool accessory. Now, a couple of caveats with the extender. One is, you can't just put it on a, a Canon brand extender. You can't just put on any Canon telephoto lens. They're certain lenses are designed to accept a Canon brand extender. I don't have one with me. But part of the reason for that, if you look at the front of a Canon brand extender, take the lens cap off on the extender and you look at the front element, the front element literally projects out about a quarter of an inch or so to go into the back of the lens to which it's being attached to give us better peripheral image coverage and better image sharpness at the edges. The catch is, many lenses that are not designed for extenders, the rear element of those lenses is almost flush with the back of the lens. So if I take that extender with the out front element poking out and try to put it on this, I can't get them together. It's, it just isn't gonna work. So the bottom line is Canon brand extenders are compatible with fixed focal length L series lenses, 135 millimeter and up, that includes the 180 millimeter macro lens. It also includes the two 400 millimeter DO lenses, which are kind of an interesting special purpose lens. Um, and it'll include these zooms and only these zooms. Any version of the 70 to 200 F 2.8, any version of the 70 to 200 F 4 L, and either version of the 100 to 400 L, the old one or the brand new one, which I just showed you. But that's it. You'll notice that that broad swath of lenses that we sell in the 70 or 75 to 300 category, they're not on here. So those lenses won't work with a Canon brand extender. So that's one limitation. Now to the young lady's question, uh, because she asked the question, with an extender, do you lose image quality? Do you lose sharpness and contrast? And to answer that question, the basic, the short one word answer is, yeah, you're gonna lose a little. Anytime you multiply the focal length and what the lens is reporting back to the camera, if you stop and think about it, you're also multiplying or magnifying any of the anomalies or whatever in the lens or imperfections in the lens as well. So any aberrations or whatever that may be present, you're magnifying them as you send that, in, that information from the lens back into the camera to the imaging sensor. The good news is that the lenses that are designed to take the extenders are designed to work with them very well. So particularly as we've moved from the original Canon extenders, the 1.4 and 2X from back in the, around you know, the, 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 the end of the 20th century, uh, into the version 3s that we're using today, the optical performance of these extenders has gotten progressively better. So, yeah, if you're looking for that last little nth bit of sharpness and to be able to count every eyelash on the model's eyes or whatever, you know, if you can take the shot without the extender, you're probably going to have a little easier time counting. But particularly with the 1.4 extender and now with the, the, the most recent 2X, the hit you take in terms of image quality is pretty minimal. Uh, and we've got plenty of pros out there who are using these on a regular basis. Uh, I can tell you from my own personal experience, going back quite some time, that uh, there was a time when I was shooting a lot of sports and I frankly regarded a 300 f2.8 and a 1.4 extender as like my standard combination. I regarded that as a 420 millimeter f4 lens that I could convert into a 300 28 by taking the extender off when I needed the speed, if I was shooting in low light or whatever. But otherwise, I just, the extender was always on. It, the performance was that good. So, you know, at, at this level, I think most of these lenses, you're gonna find very, very good optical performance. Perfectionists that are looking for just that last little nth bit of sharpness, um, yeah, you're gonna, you know, you'll see a difference if you look hard enough for it. We've spoken about the L-series lenses in the Canon system. I wanna to touch on that briefly, just if nothing else, so you know what they are. I don't wanna oversell these, but I wanna give you a, a realistic look at what they are, why they're different, you know, what some of the benefits are, and give you a sense of where they are in the line. 
These are lenses that are designed for professional use and are endowed first and foremost with optical technologies to give us one of two things, either just crackerjack optical performance or to give us professionally good imagery at combinations of focal lengths and maximum apertures that otherwise we just simply couldn't have done. You think of lenses like the 24 f1.4, the 200 f2, the 400 f2.8, lenses that, I'm not saying they're unique in the industry, but lenses that really push the design envelope in terms of focal length and how wide the maximum aperture is, those are challenges for an engineer to make those lenses good. L-series technology makes that possible. So we've got about two dozen of these lenses in the system and they include you know, long telephoto lenses, hand-holdable telephoto lenses. I mentioned the 300 f4, the 400 5.6 is a lens that bird photographers have used for decades and loved. Wide-angle lenses, zooms. So there's a broad variety of lenses in our system that have that L designation, even macro lenses. Again, L-series lenses are characterized by one or more of three different optical technologies. Either a large diameter ground and polished aspheric element in the system and or fluorite elements, one or more of those, and or two or more ultra-low dispersion, we call it UD, glass elements. Any of those technologies in a lens that we can put on any Canon camera that will accept an EF lens and the engineers will label it an L-series lens. Uh, we're seeing also, on, on, particularly on the newer L-series lenses over the, that have been introduced over the past like seven, eight years, uh, a big difference in terms of the durability and strength of the lens uh, and the weather-resistant design. And one last thing is in the past few years, we've seen some second-generation lenses come into the L-series, like the, the new 24 to 70 f2.8 version 2, Roman numeral 2, uh, the 70 to 200 f2.8 version 2. Some of these newer lenses that have come in have just been phenomenal in terms of the image quality. I am not joking. Um, so for people that are really, you know, looking for the very, very best, some of these newer introductions to the L-series are just outstanding. Let me, before I get into this, I want to mention one other thing about the L-series lenses, and that is that to a certain degree, in the eyes of some of our customers, we've almost become a victim of our own success because of the reputation that the L-series lenses have earned over the past, really, 20 or more years. Uh, professionals and amateurs alike understand that L-series lenses are exceptional. The other side of the coin is that many, I'm not saying you folks, but there are people who just make the assumption, oh, well, if it's not an L-series lens, then it must just not be very good. That's a lens that's designed just for people, you know, taking snapshots with a Rebel, and if you really want a decent lens, you got to get an L-series lens. And that, if, if you go away believing that, that would be unfortunate because there are a lot of lenses in our system that are not L-series lenses that are extremely good. Sure. Canon lenses are built, when you look at the totality of the lenses in the system, there are over 70 of them, they're built to a variety of price points. There certainly are lenses that are designed to be lightweight, economical, and for casual amateur photographers. Uh, but there are other lenses in the system that are not L-series lenses that are great. I mentioned a couple already. The 85 f1.8, $420 lens here at B&H at the present time, that lens is super. Uh, the EFS 60 millimeter macro lens, tremendous lens. Um, there are others. So don't assume that just because a lens doesn't have the L moniker on it that it isn't going to be a real good lens because that's not always going to be the case. Now, in terms of, okay, we've talked about wide angle lenses. We've talked about telephoto lenses. We've talked about applying them in different situations. Talked about their character and that kind of thing. You're thinking about expanding your lens system. What are some of the things to consider? I mentioned already size and weight and conspicuousness. That's one thing. Think about it, the way you like to shoot. Certainly think about the type of subject matter you like to shoot. For some of you folks, that's going to be like, hey, I'm a one-trick pony. I, I like shooting birds. I like going to the, you know, the wildlife reserves and shooting birds, for instance. 
Other folks are saying, hey, I just want a great lens that I can travel with. I, you know, I may be taking a candid picture one moment, a shot of a building the next moment, you know, a shot of, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, some kind of an indoor event the next moment. You know, I, I, I got all kinds of things. It isn't one. But think about, in general, the type of things you like to do, the type of subjects you like to shoot, how close you can typically get to them, and what size those subjects are. It's not, a, it's, not, excuse me, it's not enough to just say I'm a wildlife photographer. Your lens needs are very different if you say, I like to photograph ver birds versus somebody who says, I want to go on safari and photograph elephants. It's, your needs may very well end up being different. Um, think about, you know, you know, factor in what kind of focal length lens is probably going to work for you. And keep in mind the camera that you're using now and maybe, you know, even if you're using a 7D or something like that, or you, do you have that little itch in the back of your mind that maybe in a year or so I'd like to move up to full frame? Maybe you don't. That's fine. But just be guided accordingly. Um, think about the lighting you'll be shooting in. Do you like to work available light? Do you like to shoot a lot of stuff in low light? Is the type of stuff you're shooting stuff that typically happens indoors? You know, if you're buying the lens because you got a... A, a, a daughter who's a great high school gymnast or whatever, and you want to go to all her gymnastics meets and photograph her uh, without flash, your needs are going to be very different than somebody who says, eh, I got a kid that plays Little League Baseball in broad daylight in Phoenix, and I want to you know, take pictures of him when he's out there at noontime. Again, think about the, the environment you're going to be working in. That speaks loudly to the maximum lens aperture that would, be, that would work for you. Think about image stabilization and the benefits that it can bring you. I highly recommend it. Um, the only time I recommend turning it off, if you have it, is when you are going to be mounted on a rock-solid tripod. Um, but, you know, again, entirely up to you. You may, excuse me, for the type of work you're doing, you may feel like, hey, it's, a, it's an extra expense that maybe I, don't, I can get by without. Um, as attractive as some of those wide aperture, you know, fast telephoto lenses and so on are, think about the size and the weight. Is this something you can really carry around the streets of Rome and Paris on that trip to Europe that you're going to take next summer? Maybe. Maybe not. You know, you got to think about that. And then finally, cost. That's something that, you know, only you can, can answer. You know, we all got realistic limits, you know, in terms of what we can do. You know, there's some, you know, there's some bills that would make even Bill Gates flinch. Uh, so, you know, think about just, you know, what kind of investment you want to put in. We've got answers at a broad variety of price points. As we wind down, let's talk a little bit about some of the special purpose lenses in the system. These probably wouldn't be the first additional lens you would get for a camera most of the time, but just so you're aware of what some of the other options are in the few minutes that are remaining to us. The most popular one that people get into as a special purpose lens, if you want to call it that, are the so-called macro lenses. Macro lenses are lenses that are engineered for photographing small subjects up close. We're not talking about the so-called macro zooms or whatever. These are lenses that are designed as macro lenses. Macro lenses will give you tremendous sharpness when you're up close. And another characteristic of most macro lenses, real macro lenses, is that they're designed with what they call flat field coverage, if you will. What we mean by that is that when you focus on something, this, if it's a flat subject, like a piece of paper or something like that, and you shoot square into it, you're going to get about the same sharpness at the center that you do at the very corners. Most conventional lenses, when, it all, when after all is said and done, are usually going to give you a sharper image in the center than they will at the very far edges. Most of the time, that doesn't matter. But again, if you're, this is one of the differences with a true macro lens, is that flat field coverage. Now, the other thing that's cool about the macro lenses is that they really are like a Swiss Army knife in most cases. These are lenses that you can, they'll focus to infinity. So they can be used for general purpose things. You can shoot landscapes with them if you want to. And realistically, one of the things that most of the macro lenses are, are tremendous portrait lenses. Uh, these would be a great, I have recommended a macro, macro lenses to wedding photographers because I tell them, you know, ma'am or sir, this is going to give you a lens that you can get a tack sharp close up of the bride and groom's rings and that kind of thing at the reception. But at the same time, you've got a fast lens with a wide aperture that's going to be tack sharp for available light candids in the church. And it's going to be a heck of a lot lighter and smaller than a 70 to 200 f2.8 zoom lens. So these are tremendous lenses in terms of their versatility. They don't zoom, but they still 
are like a Swiss Army knife. And they are sharp. If you buy a typical macro lens, it will, there's a real good chance it'll be the sharpest lens you own. Now, we make six macro lenses in our system at the present time. And you'll see them coming up here. I'll talk briefly about a couple of them. I've already highlighted this one, but I want to, I, I can't help underscoring it. The 60 millimeter EFS macro lens. It's exclusively for the small sensor cameras. Again, 7D, 50D, 60D, 70D mid-range cameras or the Rebel series. Um, but if you own one of those cameras, what a great addition. And for the money, you just can't beat it. It is tremendous. Another one in the EF line, so this will work on any Canon camera. Uh, is a, this is a lens I love, is the relatively new 100 millimeter f2.8 L series macro lens with image stabilization. This thing is the real deal. Uh, in terms of its practicality, its hand holdability, the image stabilization means that if you're hand holding and you stop the lens to a small aperture to get some depth of field on those close up subjects, it still gives you good performance and sharpness. This is just dandy. And there is a 100 millimeter lens, as you can see, without image stabilization for a little more than half the price. So if budget is an issue, that 100 millimeter f2.8 without IS, it's another great lens too. Now, you'll see that th these lenses come in a variety of focal lengths. Basically, what that comes down to is this. In close-up shooting of small objects, the longer the focal length of the lens is, the further back you can be. So while I can get a half life size or with an accessory, even a life size image with that 50 millimeter macro lens on a full frame camera of a small object like a bee on a flower or something, if I were to go to that 180 millimeter macro lens, I can be back about a foot and change from the front of the lens, have a lot more working distance and eh, a little less risk of upsetting a skittish subject. So that's why the difference in focal lengths in the macro lenses. Now, finally, there's one other one I want to highlight, and that is, and it's a special purpose lens. I understand this is not going to be the first lens everybody's going to get. The MPE 65 millimeter macro lens. All of the macro lenses other than this in our system will focus to infinity for normal shooting and then focus down to life size. Again, the 50 requires an accessory, but all the others will focus straight to life size. When we say life size, that's life size. That's with a full frame camera. Life size, life size meaning the image on the imaging sensor is the same size as what the actual subject is in real life. So when we blow it up on screen, obviously it looks pretty dang big. Any of the macro lenses we have will get you to life size. The MPE lens takes over from there. It's exclusively for high magnification images. So with this lens, this thing is going to keep sucking you into that subject. And you can get down to five times life size with this and it remains sharp. It's a very interesting lens if you like doing extreme close-ups and you need more than what a conventional macro lens will give you. One example of this lens uh, with a flash. This lens really works well if, you, if you're working it with one of the macro flash units or even with a handheld flash off the camera or whatever. Um, that's a 2x magnification. It'll get you down to five times magnification. Anybody want to take a guess what that is? Exactly. You get a gold star. Who said that? <laughs> you get a gold star. That's a, grain, that's a grain of rice at five times magnification. It's not a cropped image or anything. It's taken with a full frame camera. That's exactly how it came out of the camera. Um, so this is a lens that if you're thinking, hey, maybe I can, you know, get National Geographic to do an article on, you know, this, these ants that are, you know, living in my backyard or whatever, it's a lens you may want to consider. Another special purpose lens, the fisheye lens. Again, not the, the first lens everybody's going to get into. For years, we had a fixed focal length 15 millimeter fisheye that worked well with the full frame cameras. The current fisheye lens in the Canon system is a little more versatile. It's the 8 to 15 millimeter L series fisheye zoom. And at the 15 millimeter setting with a full frame camera, I can get a nice corner to corner fisheye image that bends the straight lines like a fisheye lens would. The cool thing is, though, if I put it on a small sensor camera, like a 7D, if I zoom it back to about 10 millimeters, I can get this same image. Whereas with the previous lens that couldn't zoom, if I put it on a 7D, it cropped the image, and you could still see a fisheye effect, but it wasn't that radical. And then finally, if I go back to full frame and zoom it all the way out to the 8 millimeter setting, I can literally get a circular image. 
that's the picture you get. So obviously not the kind of lens you're going to want to populate the bride's wedding album with from stem to stern, but at the same time, it's the kind of lens that can give the, the photographer who's looking for that edge, that visual something different, it's a lens you can reach for and do some very cool things with. And keep in mind, in a city like New York, it's, you know, it's plausible to rent one of these. Another uh, series of lenses that we have that are special purpose lenses, I'll just touch on these briefly, are the tilt shift lenses, which have been in our lineup for a while. These started with a series of three TSE lenses in the system, a 24 millimeter, a 45 millimeter standard lens, and a 90 millimeter short telephoto with tilting and shifting capability. Now, the 24 millimeter has since been superseded by a newer version 2, which is even sharper and does a few more cool things. And we've added an even wider lens for architectural work and so on, the 17 millimeter TSE, which is just a tremendous problem solver if you do this kind of work. Two types of things that tilt shift lenses do they shift, they tilt. Show you real quickly what that's about, just so you know. And again, I understand that for most of us, these are not lenses that are right, you know, at the center of our radar screen. Lenses that have the ability to shift are not new in the photographic world. Uh, we've had them in SLR photography for several decades. But what a shift lens does is it helps correct the problem of lines that aren't straight. When you and I go on vacation or just walk around New York and see a cool building. We put our wide angle lens on the camera and we go and you know, point the lens up a little bit and take a picture and we come back with something like this. We're normally you know, happy as a clam. But when somebody is shooting either professionally or is extremely critical or is trying to make that leap from being an enthusiast to really being a working pro, there are times you've got to get that stuff right. The problem is that you took a wide angle lens or a lens and you aim the camera up to get the whole building in the frame. That's what made the straight line start to do the pyramid thing. So the first step with a shift lens is you got to point the camera back down so it's level. Now the lines on the building or the cereal box or whatever the subject is get level too. But you're thinking, well wait a minute, I'm not, now I'm not looking at the top of the building. So, that's where the shifting comes in. The shift lens has the ability, and again, I don't have a sample here, but the shift lens has the ability to literally move the whole front section of the lens up or down, or I can turn the lens 90 degrees without loosening the mount and move it left or right. And now by moving it in that case up, I can include more and more and more of the actual subject at the top of that building. I can get results that now look a lot more like this, where the lines are straight. And understand that those gray grid lines, excuse me, those gray grid lines are just there as a reference, not just so you can sort of get a sense of that. So that's what shifting does. That's the first thing a tilt shift lens does. The other is tilt. You may be thinking, what the heck is that? No, what that's going to do is it's going to change the plane of what's in focus. Here's a shot taken with a 90 millimeter tilt shift without any shifting or tilting or anything. Everything is centered, just normal picture. We focused on the nearest of these statues, gargoyles, whatever they are, okay? So we've got a telephoto lens, and we've got limited, you know, at, at a wide aperture. In fact, it's wide open, f2.8. And you can see that our focus falls off as we go towards the background. We expect that with a telephoto lens. What if you needed to get those sharp? And just stopping the lens down to like f22 wasn't an option for whatever reason. Or even if you tried that, it didn't work. It didn't get you sharpness all the way through. The shift lens allows us or rather the tilt shift lens allows us to take the front section of the lens and literally tilt it sideways either way or we can tilt it up and down. And what we're doing is we're changing the plane of what will be in sharp focus. So we go from this to something like this. And that's taken with the lens aperture wide open at f2.8. We didn't stop the lens down at all. You can still see the depth of field is limited. If you look, the focus like at that middle gargoyle the focus is on his nose. If you move back to where his ear is, you can see it's, it's starting to get out of focus. Okay, but we changed the plane of what's in focus, so now it extends down the length of those bad boys. So that's what the tilt shift lenses are about. A great professional problem solver. There's a lot of folks that do studio work that use them on a regular basis. Again, in a city like New York, 
understand that they may be something that you want to treat yourself to as a rental someday and just, you know, take it home for the weekend and just, you know, play with things. It isn't just for architecture. They're great for a lot of different type of things, even portraits. And then finally, here's another lens that completely flies under the radar. A lot of people in our, don't, that are Canon users aren't even aware that we make it. And that's a lens called the soft focus lens. 135 millimeter f2.8 lens with soft focus. This is a lens that's been in our system since the late 1980s, so it's been around for a long time. It's a very interesting lens. What it's going to let you do is it's got a normal focus ring, manual focus ring. It's 135 millimeter. It's not a zoom that'll zoom back and forth. It's a fixed 135 millimeter. It's got a focus ring on it, manual focus ring, and then a second ring that if you just looked at it quick, you might think, oh, well, that's a zoom ring. It's not a zoom ring. What it is is a sharpness ring that has three settings on it, zero, one, and two. If you put that at the zero setting, you've got a sharp 135 millimeter f2.8 lens. It's great for available light candids and a variety of other things. At wide apertures, if you turn that ring to the one setting, you begin to get a soft focus effect. And if you turn it to the two setting, you get a very distinct soft, fo soft focus effect. And the cool thing is it teams with the aperture you're using to change the effect, so you can repeat it over and over. Uh, anywhere between f2.8 and 5.6, it'll give you the softness. If you stop it down more than that to like f8, f11, it's just a straight, sharp lens. Soft focus lenses, whether you're working with ours or looking in a catalog of one of these medium format companies or something like that, in almost all cases, soft focus lenses work by laying softness over sharpness. They give you basically a core sharp image so that you can see the bride's eyelashes and all that good stuff. But then they induce deliberate, usually, spherical aberration to give you a, a veiled softness over that core of sharpness. And that's how you get that soft focus effect. Anybody can take a, you know, a, a skylight or UV filter and you know, rub a little nose grease or Vaseline on it or something and just get a soft image. But then everything is soft. The soft focus lens goes about its business a little differently. And that's why some photographers still use them. So the bottom line is I started out by saying this isn't one of these deals where the person that has the most lenses in their camera bag wins. Uh, it's do you have the right ones to give you the visual outlook and so on that you want that's going to work for your photography. Um, it doesn't mean that you got to have like whole lots of them. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to extremes. You don't have to have a 14 millimeter lens and a 600 millimeter lens to get good pictures. Um, but understand you've got so many choices and what each one does is it changes what your camera and your eye together can do. You literally get a different point of view that you can then, it's up to you, to go out and exploit that further. Um, and that's, that's really what it's all about is understanding not just, oh, cool, I, I need an ultra wide angle lens because it's the next thing I should get. It's understanding how do I make that, how do I make powerful images with that lens? How do I take what that lens does and use its character and characteristics to give me great images? And that's up to each of you. Folks, it's been a joy to be here with you. Thank you so much. You're very, very kind. Thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.